Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, Madam Provost, Professor Gibson, distinguished dignitaries, too many to list and name here uh, this afternoon, members of the Macmillan family, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to greet you on what I will call another great day at Morgan State University and to welcome you to yet another activity of Morgan's sesquicentennial celebration. Our celebration began in December of 2016 with a worship service at Sharp Street Memorial United Methodist Church, the place of our founding. And it will end in December of 2017 with our commencement exercises here on campus, at which time we will send forth yet another class of Morgan graduates who are the embodiment of the vision, the dreams, and the purposes that guided our founding in 1867. In between those two dates, Morgan has held and will offer a great variety of activities extending throughout the year, reasserting our evolving purpose, tracing our steady progress over the years, and affirming our promise and our potential to grow the future and lead the world. This is the theme of our sesquicentennial celebration, purpose, progress, promise. And this activity today is one of the high points of our celebration and feature of our sesquicentennial Women's History Month celebration as well, which has included a full calendar of activities such as an evening with April Ryan, a panel on women's contributions to the civil rights movement, a Morgan Women's Authors Showcase, a symposium on the ev evolutionary role of Miss Morgan, and of course the rededication of the Virto F. Welcome Bridge. Today we just held the second annual Ruth T. Sheffy Lecture in African American Female Studies, made possible by a generous donation and honoring the longest continually serving professor in the history of Morgan State University, Dr. Ruth Sheffy, who served on our faculty for 62 years. I believe Dr. Sheffy may have arrived by now. If not, she will join us just a little bit later on. And so we continue that celebration of our sesquicentennial and of our women's history celebration with today's activity and the unveiling of this exhibit. Bear with me for just a moment. Our sesquicentennial celebration commemorates the remarkable journey on which this institution embarked 150 years ago. It started with a passion in the hearts, a vision in the minds, and the audacity of hope in the souls of black folk who were former slaves in Maryland and long before emancipation became Methodist preachers who were committed to what they called the moral and intellectual elevation of their race through education. With the assistance of their white Methodist church counterparts, who had the resources and the commitment to make their dream a reality, they were able to make a modest beginning of nine male students gathered for the first time on April 30th, 1867, in the lecture hall at Sharp Street Methodist Episcopal Church in Baltimore. But you know, given the times and given the place, that was an extraordinary undertaking and the institution that they have helped to found has been extraordinary ever since. In fact, one of the enduring and endearing legacies of Morgan State University, that has always been a place where ordinary people come and go on to do extraordinary things. And the rest of this is history. It is a remarkable history. From the Centenary Biblical Institute in 1867 to Morgan College in 1890, and the awarding of the first bachelor's degree to George W. F. McMechan in 1895. Then to Morgan State College, one of only two public liberal arts colleges in Maryland in 1939. To Morgan State University in 1975, Maryland's designated public ur urban university, which awarded its first doctorate to L. C. C. Gladden in 1983. And now in 2017, to Morgan State University, 
a Carnegie classified doctoral research institution, one of only four public doctoral research institutions in Maryland, one of the nation's premier HBCUs, a major producer of African American degree holders in a variety of disciplines at every level from the bachelor's to postdoctoral certificates to master's degrees and to doctorates, the only institution in the nation whose entire campus has been declared a national treasure by the National Trust of Historic Preservation, and an institution that just this past December awarded a degree to its 50,000th student. At some point, you are free to applaud all of those <laughs> achievements of the university. Actually, I had a note here that said stop after each one to accommodate the applause, but you've disappointed me just a bit. This is the Morgan for which the vision and hard work of our forebearers and our antecedents laid the foundation 150 years ago. And during our sesquicentennial celebration, we commemorate the con contributions that they and all who succeeded them, including you, have made to the building of this great university. I speak with a certain prejudice here as a very, very proud graduate of Morgan State College. And so I am pleased to welcome you to our sesquicentennial celebration, and I invite you to join us at activities throughout the calendar year as we tell the Morgan story and celebrate our institution's legacy. And so today we gather for that very purpose, to tell our story and to celebrate the Morgan legacy by honoring another Morgan woman who became a legend in our time. We will speak her name repeatedly today and will decorate her with such terms as visionary, pioneer, pathfinder, trailblazer, pace setter, community leader, educational activist, fearless soldier, mighty civil rights warrior, and distinguished and venerable centenarian, all because she was an ordinary woman who went on to accomplish extraordinary things. A woman who spent some of her childhood days living on this very campus where we sit today, and years later became the first chair of the Board of Regents of that very institution. You may applaud for that as well. And so, I am pleased to welcome you this afternoon on this great day at Morgan State University to this sesquicentennial event and to this unveiling ceremony of this exhibit, honoring the remarkable journey and the extraordinary life and legacy of Mrs. Enolia P. McMillan. We shall begin the program portion of this unveiling ceremony, and the program appears on page 30 of your booklet, with greetings from the Honorable Kwaisi Nfume, Chair of the Morgan State University Board of Regents, followed by Dr. David Wilson, President of Morgan State University, and by Dr. Gloria Gibson, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, in 1979, in a rally, Ms. McMillan thought that the crowd had not really awakened yet, and so she looked at me in my mid or late 20s and said, young man, go out there and loosen them up. So <laughs> I'm going to do the same thing I did on that same day, and I need you in a moment of reaffirmation to help me. And will you do that? Yeah. Okay. So please take the hand of the person seated next to you, and if you have two, you have to do that, okay? Look at least one of them in the eye, <laughs> all right? And repeat after me, say, hello, neighbor. Hello, neighbor. hello, friend. hello friend. God has brought us, God has brought us through, thick thin, through thick and thin, and to our cause, to our cause we, must we must be true. But I can't help it I can't help if I look better than you. <laughs> Aha! Uh -huh. See, it worked then and it works now. Thank you again and, and welcome to Morgan State University, where together, as you just heard, we are commemorating the 150th anniversary of our founding four years after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This institution was born and has done magnificent things over that period of time. Now, we're biased, but check the record. Uh, a couple of things I want to do. First of all, I want to say thank you to some people who are very meaningful in getting this together because we believe at Morgan that we thank people. 
Secondly, I want to, um, my task is to recognize some of our special guests who are here because we're glad that they're here and we're glad that all of you are here. And then thirdly, I'll have a little to say about uh, Ms. McMillan because uh, the people coming behind me, particularly Professor Gibson and the family, uh, have much, much more to say in that regard. So allow me to begin by thanking uh, Dr. David Wilson, the president of Morgan State University, who was acknowledged a moment ago, who didn't get up, who I'm going to make stand up, because he deserves your applause and your thanks for what he has been doing here. Dr. Wilson. Dr. Wilson has done a tremendous job in the seven or so years that he has been with us. And as chairman of the Board of Regents, I can tell you, speaking on behalf of that board, and I'm going to mention a few of them in a minute, we are particularly glad to be in partnership, working together as we do to move this university forward. I thank him for his leadership across the nation on national higher education issues. I thank him for his stewardship of this special institution that we call Morgan. And I thank him for his friendship which has allowed us to work together and to change things together and to watch this university grow together. Secondly, I'd really be remiss if I didn't thank Professor Larry Gibson Esquire, who has done this. Yes, stand, Larry, stand please, you got it. You'll be standing a lot. Diana said it's okay, stand up. <laughs> Let me just say, none of this probably would have taken place if Larry didn't push and cajole, but most of all, have a vision. He is a dreamer. He is a visionary, a teacher, a historian, an archivist, a preserver of our culture, a guardian of our civil rights, a friend and a colleague who just adds this now to a long, long list of things that you saw when other people didn't see and they have come into being. I thank you very much, as the president will, I'm sure on behalf of the university, and as I know the family will, because of this special effort that you, you have made. Bernie Hollis, who was just here at the podium, uh, is to be thanked also. He is chair of the Sesquicentennial Committee. Now, uh, you get to be 150 years old, you know, that's a whole lot of celebration, so. This is just one in a long, long series of things that have and will be happening at the university. Thank you so much. I called Bernie yesterday and said, personally, I just wanted to not have you assume that we appreciate it, but that to know that we really, really do. And uh, Dr. Edwin Johnson, who I saw a moment ago, Edwin is in charge of all of the Women's Month's activities here. He's coordinating all of them. He got an idea long ago that this might work, and it did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Uh, and Kim McCalla, who's all the way in the back up against the wall, is our uh, director of the physical plant. She did all the physical coordination and everything else that you see in here. Kim, thank you so much. The installations, all of this. And every time you see a new building go up on campus, it's you, Kim is the person that's, that's behind it. Um, we have, because Ms. McMillan served as the uh, first woman chairperson of the board, and I think the only woman to chair the Board of Regents. Uh, two members, three members of that board who are here today uh, representing as they are themselves, but more importantly the board and in special honor to her work and her significance as a former chair of the board. They are uh, by seniority, uh, can I do it that way? Okay. <laughs> Regent Penny Taylor, seniority only in terms of eight time on the board. Regent Penny Taylor. Thank you, Penny. Regent Winston Wilkerson, who legend has was a great athlete here at Morgan, but we're still trying to get the records to confirm that. And our student regent, and I want to say student regent because two of Mrs. McMillan's granddaughters both served individually as student regents. The current student regent, Mr. Matthew Reeds. Now, I am looking for Dr. Earl S. Richardson, and I don't know if he has arrived yet. Yes, you can't sneak in. It just that doesn't work. Um, Dr. Richardson, stand up for a second. We, you have 25 years as president of this institution. <laughs> whom this library is named after. 
and who worked side by side with Mrs. McMillan. Thank you so much for being here today, and I know you have a special pride about all of this because you were there as it unfolded. Uh, Chief Judge Robert Bell is on his way. He has not gotten here yet. You know, Bob Bell has retired, so they tell me when you retire, you take your time getting places. And uh, I talked with him yesterday. He said that he, in fact, would be here. We are also very honored and happy to have the Baltimore City State's attorney and a friend, uh, Marilyn Mosby. Please, Marilyn, stand up. Thank you for... And I know it's a busy day with all that's going on with court and everything else, but we really do appreciate your presence. We know that Nick would be here if he could. It's just that he's in session in Annapolis. But thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, State Senator Nathaniel McFadden is en route also. Uh, Ms. McMillan was his principal, I think, when he first became a teacher many, many years ago. And uh, we are honored to have with us the chairman of the state's Economic Matters Committee, Delegate Derek Davis. Derek. <laughs> Thanks for coming up from Annapolis. And I know it was uh, a stretch to do that, but we really, really do appreciate it. And we appreciate your leadership on that committee also. Uh, and former State Delegate Clarence Tiger Davis is, hasn't gotten in yet? Okay, he's en route uh, as a special friend of the family. Now, because Mrs. McMillan also served as the first woman president ever of the national NAACP, we are really happy to have from the national office and from the president's office there, the vice president of strategic planning, Andrea, where are you? Oh, okay. Um, and Andrea G is here uh, in the capacity of official representative, but also here out of her support for this family. And the same definitely is true for Kia Graham Pearson, I got that right, <laughs> who for many, many, many years, along with the uh, family of John Bryan and Eleanor Bryan and all the others, worked hand in glove with Mrs. McMillan in rally after rally after rally. So thank you both for, for being here with us. Uh, I do know that they're members of her church, the Calvary Baptist Church. We want to at least say hello and to let you know that we know that you're here uh, and to also acknowledge briefly and to really thank Bishop Monroe Saunders and the entire Transformation Church family that are here in support. Where's the church family? Stand, there they are, waving their hands. Bishop, thank you. And thank my thanks to your family for being here with us. Um, and one final thing that I do want to mention, and that is we're glad to have from the Boule, uh, Gamma Boule, and specifically, uh, Sire Archon Donald Tynes, who I think is here somewhere. There he is. Sire Archon, thank you very much. <laughs> Tiffany is an Arcusa, and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the Boule. Um, and um, on a personal note, can I do that for 10 seconds? I'm just glad my sisters are here. Darling, Luana, and Michelle, who I love, and who are upset that I did this just now. But you know, I love my sisters, what can I say? So I'm glad, glad that they're here for this personal moment. And Carl and Bobby Swan, thank you very, very much uh, for, for joining us. And Mrs. McMillan's last mentee in the NAACP, Eric Bryant. Eric, where are you? Area, oh, okay. Good to see you, Eric. You should be down here somewhere. She loved you. Okay, um, so that's my role to sort of acknowledge and to thank, and I, I, I really thank you for your indulgence. A couple quick things uh, about Enolia P. McMillan, who, as uh, you heard earlier, you'll keep hearing about and hearing about both today and long after this has concluded. I don't even know where I first met. Ms. McMillan. She just seemed to have always been there. I do know I had just gotten elected to the city council, so I was about 28 years old, 29, I don't remember. And um, I ran into her at a rally on school funding where she was arguing that the state and the city had to make educational priority, particularly in grades one through six, a priority, which was not the case at the time. And I heard this booming voice as I came up. And I saw this hand going out like that. And then I saw this little lady in this little frame and was absolutely in awe, 
in absolute awe of the way she commanded attention, the way she spoke from her heart, uh, the way she made people think about things that they had not thought about, and because of the way that she held her sense self with a sense of dignity. So I fell in love with Anolia P. McMillan at that point. I was going to be her soldier, run through any wall she needed me to run through, do anything she needed me to do, and we bonded and became very good friends. In fact, I ended up going to jail because of Mrs. McMillan. <laughs> True story, 1985, in front of the South African Embassy. We'd all gone there to protest the apartheid system, free Nelson Mandela. You know, it was getting late in the day. We'd marched for about five or six hours. The sun was starting to arc. And we said, okay, well, looks like we're getting ready to go. And people started picking up their signs. And she said, young man, I think you're going to go to jail tonight. I said, go to jail? She said, well, somebody has to go to jail, and I'm too old. <laughs> Otherwise, we won't get the headline we want. We want people to know how much this meant to us. So she picked me and uh, Father Damien from St. Gregory's Church and a couple of other people, and we got arrested and went to jail. And that was the first time that I had gone to jail for protesting. She said, don't worry, I'll have somebody over here sometime tomorrow afternoon to get you out. <laughs> and she did, she did. So press conferences, demonstrations, strategy sessions, it just went on and on and on. And even though we were separated by so many years, we had a natural connection on issues, particularly issues of fairness and equality. Rosa Parks, true story. Coretta Scott King, true story. Shirley Chisholm, true story. C. Dolores Tucker, true story. Every time I ran into one of them, they say, Kwesi, tell us, how's Anoya doing? And I said, she's doing great. And they would have a story about when they were together at some demonstration or working on some issue, and it just went on and on and on. And another true story, Larry, you'll appreciate this. I was in the chambers of uh, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall in 1987, and we were there talking about the old Baltimore, which he still really didn't like because of what he had to go through here. And a bunch of reporters rushed in. I guess it was press availability. And they had the cameras snapping and they're writing. And he turned immediately into an old curmudgeon. And, arr, arr, had to turn those cameras off. Because he had cataracts. And the flashes were bothering his eyes. And he just groveled at them. And they all just kind of melted and said, yes, sir, yes, sir. They asked two questions and got out. And he turned to me and said, see, I can be an old curmudgeon when I want to be one. And then he said, but tell me, how's it know you're doing? How's it know you're doing? True story, true story. And I said, sir, she's doing great, she's doing fine. So all those years and all that time make for a lot of stories that I won't bore you with, but I will tell you that her intelligence, her passion for justice, and her fearlessness were exceeded only by her dignity and her grace very dignified, graceful woman who got what she wanted because she never, ever let up. She was the Lena Horn of the liberation movement who always fought for a society where justice would be the supreme ruler, but law would be its instrument, where freedom would be the dominant creed, but order its practice, and where equity would really be the common practice, but fraternity would be the true common human condition. Much like State Senator Verda Welcome, who we acknowledged here a few weeks ago, Enolia P. McMillan was a stalwart in the storm, one who stood steady and steadfast through it all. And no matter how long the journey, cold the chill, fierce the enemy, or few the friends, she always found a way to capture our will to make a difference and then would challenge us to dare to make a difference. She took the towering presidents, as well as the tiny people every day in the street, and she found a way to give them hope and lifted them up. Mike Mitchell is here from the Mitchell family who understands in, how, in a very special way. She found us one day, like many in your family, on life's dusty mantle of whatnots. And Anoya always had, and this is not disrespectful for me to say Anoya because she actually gave me permission. She had a way of lifting us up and dusting us off and making us feel like, you know, 
I really am somebody, and if I am somebody, I should do all that I can while I have time to make the world a better place for me and all of those who look at me because I am now somebody. So it's that spirit that we gather in that this program unfolds in and that I hope you will walk away with. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I want to take this opportunity to officially uh, welcome everyone once again to uh, Morgan State University. Uh, of course, um, Dr. Bernie Hollis, uh, the chairman of the board, uh, Kwesi and Fumi, uh, they have spoken a bit uh, about the incredible path that this institution has traveled uh, since 1867. And so I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, but I do want to say how honored we are, how privileged we are as an institution to stand here today celebrating our sesquicentennial to honor an individual who in 102 years was such a remarkable educator, a remarkable civil rights leader. I had the opportunity as Professor Gibson and I were cogitating about uh, and uh, pl planning and reading about this exhibit. Uh, and I thought I knew a little bit more than I did about Mrs. McMillan. But I had an opportunity to discover something that I had not discovered. And it was her master's thesis from Columbia University. And it was a remarkable piece of scholarship. It gave true meaning to the words behind me. She spoke, wrote very eloquently, very persuasively about the inequities that existed between quote unquote Negro teachers and Negro schools and non-Negro teachers and other schools. And while I am no ultimate academic authority, I can say that that master's thesis is better than 99% of the doctoral thesis that I have read in my higher education days. And so this exhibit that we are chronicling here today is one that really tries to portray Mrs. McMillan's long and distinguished career of service, of service to our great city of Baltimore, of service to our great state of Maryland, and of service to this nation. And so let me just briefly highlight just a little bit, I won't be long, about her incredible connections to Morgan. Uh, you've heard a little bit of this, but I want to be crystal clear. As a child, she actually lived right here on our campus because her father operated a farm on the campus, and she lived on the campus, on that farm. And then later, as an educator and a civil rights leader, uh, she was frequently on this campus, based on what I have read and what I have been able to uncover from Dr. Gibson, Professor Gibson. Uh, she was on this campus giving fiery speeches. I can see why Kwesi was so fired up, <laughs> uh, because uh, that was her purpose. She was here attending meetings. She was here attending conferences. She was here to ensure that the students and others here at Morgan, that they were just not biding their time, that they understood all too well what they were being educated here to do, and it was to make things right in this country. She then uh, enjoyed special support from former Morgan State President Dwight 
Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, because former President Holmes had been dean at Howard University School of Education, uh, and Mrs. McMillan was the only graduate from his program uh, to have received special honors. And so they enjoyed this very, very special bond, and he was incredibly supportive of her efforts early on, and that was another aspect uh, of her great connection to Morgan State University. Now, she also was a true member of the Morgan family. And so her son, Bethea, taught mathematics on our faculty for 10 years. And he met his wife. And they'll regale me with that story. I won't repeat that publicly. Um, and she also, they met here, and she was here on our faculty, an English professor, uh, Lois McMillan, and she remains uh, one of the most esteemed faculty members here at Morgan. Uh, Bethea and Lois's three daughters, uh, whom you heard a little bit about, uh, but uh, those three daughters and her granddaughters, all, all graduated from Morgan State University. Now, uh, two of them, as you heard from the chair of the board, uh, two of them, Angela uh, and Sally, uh, served as student regents, following, of course, uh, not in the footsteps, you following in the footsteps, Matthew, uh, of those who've come before you, uh, and and being a good student of history and going back and reading those board minutes, as a good president should do, um, we finally, finally got a student constitution passed. And that really goes back to the tenure of these two individuals on the Morgan State University Board of Regents. Believe it or not, it has taken 20 years, to be kind, uh, to get that through. But that's where it commenced, and we passed that with this student region. And so they didn't come there just to warm seats. They came there to be true to the history and the legacy of their grandmother. And then the oldest daughter, uh, Dr. Tiffany McMillan Nfume, uh, from whom you will hear shortly, is also a Morgan administrator. Uh, serving as our director of the Office of Student Retention and Success with Dr. Kara Turner, who is our vice president. And Dr. McMillan uh, is also, uh, Dr. Nfume, uh, is also a former Miss Morgan State University. And so um, these relationships run really, really deep here at Morgan, and the McMillan family is one of Morgan's great families. Now, Mrs. McMillan's involvement with Morgan continued throughout her entire life. And so, doing a little bit more digging, um, she was not only an incredible leader, uh, but much as we heard from Dr. Sheffy, who has arrived this morning, um, who gave this institution her intellect and gave it her wisdom she also gave it her purse, as Dr. Sheffy has done. And so Mrs. McMillan actually endowed a scholarship fund uh, here at Morgan State University. And she served on the board from 1975 to 1984, and she was the first chair of the board. Not the, she was the first female chair of the board, but she was the first chair of the board after Morgan became a state university. And that sets her apart more than just her being the first female chair. She's the first chair of the board when the university went from being Morgan State College to Morgan State University. And so in 1991, in recognition of her decades of contributions to this university and the nation, uh, Morgan State University, under 
uh, the uh, leadership of former President Earl Richardson uh, awarded her an honorary Doctor of Laws degree uh, in 1991. And so I wish at this moment simply to express great appreciation uh, as uh, Kwaisi has done before me uh, to all those individuals uh, who have been responsible for what you are about to see. I want to thank once again Dr. Bernie Hollis and the Sesquicentennial Celebration Coordinating Committee because Dr. Hollis chaired the Morgan State University Centennial Committee as we turned 100 and here he is chairing our committee as we turn 150. And so it's great to have that kind of history, if you will, and anytime we don't know what we know, need to know about our great university, uh, the first thing we do is we go to one of two offices. We go to Dr. Hollis's office or we go to Dr. Adams' office, and they set us straight. So thank you very much, Dr. Hollis and the Sesquicentennial Celebration Committee. Now, last, uh, we really do owe a great debt of gratitude, um, beyond words, uh, to um, Professor Larry S. Gibson. Um, and I, I have to say that, um, I, so um, I've, of course, enjoyed reading, you know, I enjoyed reading everything that Professor Gibson writes, and so as I was making my way through his book, uh, and he and I were having a conversation, he said, well, you gotta go to page, and, you know, and so he takes out the book and he takes me to page, whatever the page was, and he said, you gotta read this about Mrs. Macmillan, and so I'm reading, he said, well, look, read this, read the fine print, read the footprint, right, you know, the footnotes, and so I'm like, okay, Professor Gibson, I'm not a speed reader, but I'll eventually get there, you know, and, and so, um, he, began, he became so excited um, about this legacy and said, now, we got to do something about this. And so for those of you who work with Professor Gibson, you know, when he says, we got to do something about this, you may as well start finding some money from someplace, right? Uh, and so uh, Professor Gibson, um, we really do appreciate your leadership, um, not just to this exhibit, but your leadership in this space that you've been in. And Professor Gibson, Professor Larry Gibson is celebrating a very, very special birthday. And so please join me in wishing a happy, can I say the number? 75th birthday to <laughs> Professor Larry Gibson. And before you leave campus today, if you have time, you can go right across the street to our student center on the first floor and you will see the first exhibit that Professor Gibson curated for us. It depicts the role of Morgan State University students in the college sit-in movement in America. And so just to set the record straight, the college sit-in movement in America commenced across the street at the Northwood Shopping Center, and that was done by Morgan State University students here in Maryland, not in a state to our south. And so um, uh, I, think, uh, I thank all of you for uh, coming and uh, you're in for a pure treat as you uh, will listen uh, to uh, Provost Gibson next and then to Professor Larry Gibson who will walk us through this incredible historical exhibit. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm so happy to see everyone here this afternoon on this very, very special occasion. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Um, I uh, did not know Mrs. McMillan. I did not know her. Um, but when you don't know someone, what do we do? We do research, right? <laughs> We find out about that person. And so I started reading about her and all of her accomplishments over so many years. And I said, what can I possibly say? What can I possibly say 
that will acknowledge all that this beautiful black woman has done. And so in my mind, I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a rapid fire. I'm going to do a rapid fire. So here's my rapid fire. She was dedicated, service-oriented, passionate, loving, caring, accomplished, steadfast, determined, courageous, beautiful, intelligent, God-fearing, cook, sports fan, warrior, crusader, learner, listener, role model, educator. That's what I learned when I read about her. She sought excellence in everything that she did. And that's what I really love about her, even though I didn't know her. She sought excellence. And she also acknowledged, and I really love this part, she said, and it's in your program, I am a strong, I am a strong black woman. This is Women's History Month. This is Women's History Month. And we celebrate Mrs. McMillan and all of her accomplishments. But we also celebrate black women everywhere. And we realize that black women need opportunities. And here at Morgan, we are here to provide those opportunities for black women and black men because this is a caring institution. This is a wonderful day. I cannot wait to see the exhibit. But let us keep in mind the strengths of Mrs. McMillan and let us try as best we can to walk in her footsteps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, Madam Provost. You've heard it several times, but you hear it one more time. Dr. Ruth Turner Sheffy, when you know the maiden name as well as the rest of the name, Dr. Ruth Turner Sheffy, my mentor, my uh, former professor, my former colleague in the English department, and I switched on her. She was my boss when I joined the English department, and I became her boss as chair of the English department, and then her dean. And through all of that, we remain friends, uh, <laughs> remarkably so. <laughs> Dr. Sheffy is the longest continuously serving faculty member in the history of this institution, 62 years. <laughs> Let let me, let me paraphrase that as you taught me in advanced composition, Dr. Sheffy. She taught here more than one-third of the history of the institution. More than one-third. Would have been 50 years, 62, but more than one-third of the history of the institution, she was here setting an example for us all. Mr. President, I, 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 I'm grateful for your compliments, but yes, I did not share the centennial. <laughs> celebration of the university. I was a student here uh, during the centennial celebration. I, I, I sat there counting how many years that would make me, uh, but I did share the 125th anniversary uh, at the university. I am pleased now to present to you Dr. Tiffany McMillan Mfume, Director of the Center for Academic Success and Retention at Morgan State University, a distinguished alumna of Morgan State University, and of course, as you've heard before, granddaughter of Mrs. Enolia McMillan. She will express gratitude on behalf of the family. Good afternoon. Thank you, President David Wilson, the Board of Regents, the Chairman of our sesquicentennial and our 125th anniversary committees, Dr. Bernie J. Hollis, 
Assistant University Archivist, Dr. Edwin T. Johnson, who spearheaded this event, and especially thank you to the curator of this exhibit and our friend, University of Maryland Law Professor Larry Gibson. We are truly honored to celebrate the legacy of our mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and auntie, Enolia Pettigen McMillan. So many things have been said already about my grandmother's life of service as an educator and a civil rights leader, and so much remains to be shared from our curator, Professor Gibson. I would like to spend my few minutes sharing with you our perspectives as her family on how great a woman she was even in her own home. I'm the oldest daughter of Enolia McMillan's only son, my dad, Bethay D. McMillan Jr., who is here today. My parents asked me to speak on behalf of our family today because I spent many years as my grandmother's travel companion from the age of 14 until my adult years in my 30s, traveling all over the country to Los Angeles, Atlanta, Detroit, St. Louis, New Orleans, Chicago, Las Vegas, San Francisco, and she took me to the Bahamas, just to name a few. We had a, had a very close family over the years, and Enolia was a centerpiece and a matriarch in this family. Her life of service to the community, the state of Maryland, and this nation did not prevent her from being a loving wife, a fantastic mother, a very fun grandmother, and a committed auntie. She was indeed a dedicated servant to the NAACP. She was so dedicated, in fact, that when my dad met, courted, and proposed marriage to my mother, whom she loved and adored, by the way, they were very close, she congratulated them on their engagement, but promptly informed them that their June 25th wedding date conflicted with the 1971 National NAACP <laughs> Convention. So my parents actually did change their wedding date to accommodate her participation in and commitment to the National Convention. My grandmother was a humble and unassuming woman on the outside, especially as she aged. However, she was a lion to anyone who knew who she really was. No one could out fundraise her, especially not for her church and not for the NAACP. My parents' basement today is filled with all of my trophies from winning the NACP baby contest. <laughs> One year at the National Convention, my grandmother was selling her NACP I Gave buttons. Many of you in the audience purchased one or more of these buttons from my grandmother. During the convention, she said to a man in the hallway, excuse me, sir, would you like to support the NACP by purchasing a button for $1? He responded, no, I would not like to purchase a button, and it would be great if the NACP would come out of the dark ages and stop trying to sell $1 buttons to raise money. It's a crying out shame the way this university continues to do the same old thing. You can't raise any real big money by selling $1 buttons, lady. My grandmother loved this story. Later that evening, after she went to her hotel room and changed into her evening gown, that same man was winning a national award for his NACP chapter, and they called on my grandmother, Enolia P. McMillan, the national NACP president, to present him with the award. As he saw my grandmother walking toward him in her evening gown, he begged, please, don't call me out publicly. I'm so sorry for what I said earlier. She let him off the hook and decided to give him the award without any additional commentary. He later apologized profusely, especially since they announced that evening that she had raised more than $100,000 by selling those $1 buttons. <laughs> My grandmother was fun to be around, especially on trips, whether it was with me or with my mom who traveled with her. She always provided a travel budget for your entertainment and your expenses. She would sit down with you at the beginning of the trip and let you know exactly how much money she'd set aside for you for each day. On trips, you couldn't beat her when it came to waking up. When you opened your eyes in the hotel room, Enolia McMillan was up, already dressed, ready for the day, sitting in a chair watching you sleep. 
She was so generous and understated. She didn't like a lot of the perks or the benefits for herself. Every year that she was president of the national NACP, a two-bedroom suite would be reserved for her at the convention hotel. She always invited one of her team members to stay with us in the suite. George Bunton, who's here today, there he is, was one of our roommates who she invited to stay with us. She often gave her VIP tickets away to local NACP branch staffers so that they could enjoy the events and the celebrity events free of charge. And she always insisted on paying for her tickets. She wanted to give and never take for herself. She encouraged me to make friends on our trips and not to, quote, hang around with the older people. She would say, I trust you. Just let me know where you are and meet me back at the room on time. When I would help to get her ready for major events, she would often say, don't give me too much makeup. I want to look just like myself. I want everyone to recognize me. <laughs> My grandmother loved spending time with her son, her daughter-in-law, and her grandchildren. She actually lived in our home with us for the last 14 years of her life. Angela and I had enjoyed sleepovers at her house, but David and Sally had the benefit of having sleepovers in our home with her every night. She liked to wake up with them in the morning for school and see them when they arrived home in the afternoon. She loved to incentivize good behavior. She liked to create fun little games like the food bank where you earned money for eating vegetables and drinking water. It was an elaborate pyramid scheme. <laughs> she enjoyed cooking and baking and entertaining. Dr. Ben Hooks and his wife Frances often joined us, enjoyed, joined us for family dinners. We spent every Christmas day at my grandmother's house growing up. My dad, still to this day, makes her famous recipes, including her orange kiss me cake, her gypsy roundelayer cake, and her pumpkin spice cake. Every year on, her, on your birthday, she would ask, what kind of cake do you want me to make for you, sugar? That's what she called us, sugar. Thank you so much for immortalizing her legacy right here at Morgan State University, an institution that has meant so much to her and to our family over the years. Generations of our family will visit the Earl S. Richardson Library which is so appropriate because she was a charter member of the Earl S. Richardson Fan Club, to reflect upon her years of self-sacrifice, service, and dedication to education, justice, and equal opportunity for all people, regardless of race, gender, or ethnicity. Will all of the members of the Macmillan family please stand? I know her oldest nephew, Edward Walker, is here with his wife, Dolores, all of the cousins, all of the cousins, Macmillans, Pettigens. Continue to stand, please. Continue to stand. Professor Gibson, will you join me, please? Surprise. On behalf of the entire Macmillan family, we would like to present you with this commemorative clock, which reads, presented to Larry Gibson Esquire, law professor, curator, historian, and friend, with thanks and deep appreciation, the family of Dr. Enolia P. McMillan, March 30th, 2017. And again, we just so much want to express our gratitude and our thanks to the Morgan family. We appreciate you and we thank you. Thank you, Dr. McMillan and Fume. Old heart habits are hard to break. <laughs> I am pleased to bring to the podium at this time the curator of the exhibit who will introduce the exhibit and conduct the unveiling. A few words about Professor Gibson. I've done my research on you as well. He's taught law since 1972, and his faculty appointments have taken him to the University of Virginia, the University of Mississippi, the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He is currently professor of law at the University of Maryland, 
Francis King Carey School of Law, where he teaches courses in evidence, civil procedure, racial discrimination and law, and election law. In addition to practicing and teaching law, however, he has spent a great deal of time researching prominent figures and developments in the civil rights movement in this country. His groundbreaking research on the early years of Baltimore's Thurgood Marshall resulted in his 2012 book, Young Thurgood, The Making of a Supreme Court Justice. And I understand that uh, you are working on the sequel to that publication right now, and that this exhibition, putting it together, has stood between you and the progress on that project, <laughs> much to the dismay of your publishing company. <laughs> Professor Gibson was also the curator of the exhibit, as the president has already mentioned, currently in Morgan Student uh, Center, documenting Morgan's civil rights uh, uh, pioneers in the civil rights movement in this country. He seems to be driven by a devotion to uncovering the details and the truth about civil rights leaders and great African Americans. He has certainly achieved this goal in this exhibit that we're about to see. So please join me in welcoming and thanking at the same time, Professor Larry S. Gibson. Thank you, Dr. Hollis, for allowing me to participate in the sesquicentennial celebrations of Morgan State University. You, you guys have really put together a fabulous year of activities. And President Wilson, thank you for approving, approving this location for the exhibit. I think it's a fantastic uh, location. It has really been a delight and a privilege uh, to explore and then to try to present uh, the, the history and the legacy of this truly extraordinary woman, Enolia McMillan. I thank Morgan's archivists, Dr. Ida Jones and Dr. Edwin T. Johnson for deciding to honor uh, Enolia McMillan and for inviting me to participate. This was their idea. I wish to thank the several people and organizations that have helped me with the research and the assembly of the materials uh, that are reflected in this exhibit. Of special importance is the Baltimore Afro-American Newspapers Archives, publisher John Oliver and archivist Sheila Scott. The Afro provided many of the images that are on this exhibit. It's just another example of the crucial role that the Afro has played in preserving and presenting uh, our history. Another group that merits special recognition are the folks from Charles County, where Enolia McMillan began her career in the 1930s. Mr. Philip Thomas, Ms. Vera Walton Merritt, officers of the Pamunkey High School Alumni Association, met with me several times and they assembled photographs and other materials uh, that, uh, about that phase of Enolia McMillan's career. And I'm just so pleased that there is a delegation from Charles County uh, here uh, with us today. I also want to recognize my design partner who worked with me on this and on similar exhibits through the years, Joseph Yor, the graphic artist who designed this exhibit. I do the research and assemble the material, but Joe and I have worked together since 1984 on a variety of uh, projects. Joe designed the exhibit that's been mentioned several times. That's in the student uh, union building, uh, student center uh, there now. Uh, I think I saw Tess a little while ago, that exhibit that you'd like of the history of the uh, uh, Baltimore branch of the Afro-American. That was uh, my research, but uh, Joe yours uh, 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 designed. Uh, 
uh, we've worked together not only on historical uh, matters, but also political matters, local, state, uh, uh, international. If it looks pretty and I get credit for it, Joe Yore did it. <laughs> And then there is the other part of my team, my permanent partner, my sounding board, proofreader, and critical eye of my wife, Diana Gibson. Mm -hmm. once, once again, she helped with every stage of this project while tolerating my cluttering the tables of our house with old newspapers, pamphlets, and photographs. I also want to thank the Macmillan family. What gracious, intelligent, beautiful, pleasant, and patient people. You tolerated my ceaseless questions and requests. You assembled hundreds of items for me and allowed me to probe your walls, your mantelpieces, your coffee tables, photo albums, and scrapbooks. Thank you very much. I'm sure you are ready to get me out of your house. But you've come for an unveiling, and so that's what we're going to do now. Dr. Wilson will be assisted in the unveiling by the members of the family of Enolia Macmillan, I now ask the family members to take their positions at the, uh, at the exhibit. Assisting Dr. Wilson on this panel is Kwaisi Nfume. I guess he is grandson-in-law. <laughs> He's married to a granddaughter, a Tiffany. Just pull it. It'll come. Okay. This is the title panel of the exhibit. The key to this was to find a photograph of Enolia Macmillan that most people had not seen and that captured her strength, intellect, and character. And we found this photograph buried in the archives of the Afro-American uh, newspapers. Assisting Dr. Wilson with this panel is the person you've just heard from, Dr. Tiffany Beth Macmillan, granddaughter. This panel covers Enolia Macmillan's earlier years. That includes the time when, as a child, she lived on this campus with her family uh, about where Spencer Hall uh, is located uh, uh, now. Uh, it also covers her high school years, her graduation from what was then called the Colored High School, and her attendance at Howard uh, a, a University. Assisting President Wilson on, on this is Sally Macmillan Guy, my student, <laughs> a graduate of the University of Maryland School of Law. Another granddaughter of Enolia Macmillan. The focus of this panel is Enolia Macmillan's years as a teacher and a principal in Charles uh, County. It has the building she taught at and other uh, uh, things about her uh, during that uh, uh, crucial uh, period. And again, uh, thank uh, the folks from uh, Charles County uh, in their assistance, uh, assistance in assembling this, uh, the material on this exhibit. Assisting Dr. Wilson on this panel is Jennifer McMillan who's married to uh, grandson David McMillan, McMillan, and she is holding Elijah Michael McMillan, great-grandson. Okay. <laughs> this, 
This panel covers the joint efforts of Enola Macmillan and Thurgood Marshall as they began the campaign for equal pay for black teachers. They succeeded in Maryland, and then Thurgood Marshall took what he and Enola Macmillan had started here in Maryland and replicated it throughout the South of the United States. <laughs> Assisting Dr. Wilson is David Bethay Macmillan, grandson, and he is holding James Bethay Macmillan, great grandson. This panel covers the period when Enolia Macmillan served as the initial president of the Maryland State Conference of NAACP branches. She coordinated the activity of 16 NAACP branches in Maryland. And during this period, she enjoyed the strong support of Morgan's president at that time, uh, Dwight uh, Holmes. All right, okay, uh, assisting Dr. Wilson here uh, is uh, <laughs> Ricardo Howell, married to a granddaughter, Angela, and uh, Levi Edwin, well, well who, who's this? This is Lily. This is Lily, okay. We got, we got All right, who, who do we have here? This is Ricardo Howell. And who is this? Who are you? Lily. All right, this is Lily. <laughs> All right, um, this panel covers the three decades during which Enolia Macmillan served as a school teacher and educator in Baltimore City. This uh, period, she played a major role in the relatively smooth desegregation of the Baltimore City public schools following the 1954 Board of Education decision. Okay. Assisting Dr. Wilson here is uh, Dr. Angela Howell, uh, granddaughter, and she is holding Levi Edwin Howell, great-grandson. <laughs> this panel covers the two decades that Enolia Macmillan served as president of the Baltimore branch of the NAACP. During her tenure, it became one of the largest branches in the nation and one of the most active uh, branches uh, in the NAACP. All right. Okay. Who do I have here? <laughs> All right. All right, we're just gonna say Lily? All right, okay. Assistant Dr. Wilson here is, I'm told, Lily, where's Lily? All right, this is where Lily's supposed to be. Lily Isabel Howell again, great granddaughter. Let's go, all right. Thank you, Lily. All right, this panel covers uh, Mrs. McMillan's service on Morgan's uh, Board of Regents. And as we've been told, she was the first chair of the Board of Regents after this institution became a state university. <laughs> Assisting President Wilson here is Lois McMillan, daughter-in-law. This panel covers Enolia Macmillan's six years as the national president of the NAACP. During those years, she persuaded the national office of the NAACP to relocate to Baltimore City. Hi. 
And our last panel, uh, Dr. Wilson is assisted by Bethay McMillan, Jr., son of Anolia McMillan. This, this panel shows just a small fraction of the well-deserved recognitions that Anolia McMillan received, including four honorary degrees, one of which was a Doctor of Law degree from the University, uh, from Morgan State University. I um, opened the ceremony by saying that this was a great day at Morgan State University. As we've gone through this ceremony, it's gotten greater and greater. Um, even I did not anticipate it would be, that it would be this great. The president said to me um, a couple of weeks ago after the Verda welcome ceremony that at every ceremony we have, we're raising the bar. I think the bar is about up here now and I'm not sure we can go any higher. But I do thank each and every one of you for being with us today to make this a great day at Morgan State University as we celebrate our 150th anniversary. <laughs>